a very specific connection between Muslims and Christians is some level of reverence and admiration for the person of Isa Islam, the person of Jesus, peace be upon him. It's special. The fact that the two largest religious groups in the world both hold this man in awe and respect and admiration is special. And it's not something we should take for granted. And you'd be shocked that many Christians have no idea, they have no clue that we have any regard whatsoever for Jesus, peace be upon him. The idea that Isa salam means anything to us is a shock to many Christians, especially when you say, yeah, we actually believe in the return of Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe Isa salam is coming back. It's like, wait, what? What are you talking about? Because the assumption is that we are Muhammadans, just as they are Christians, and so we replace Isa salam with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and so all of the implications of what Jesus, peace be upon him, means to Christians, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam means to us, which we know is not true. In fact, a very easy look at that would be that Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned more by name in the Qur'an than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jesus, alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam is mentioned 25 times, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam mentioned by name five times. That doesn't mean that Isa alayhi salam is greater than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. That means that there is a heavy emphasis on the person of Isa alayhi salam, the story of Isa alayhi salam, the mission of Isa alayhi salam, the message of Isa alayhi salam. And Allah talks about Jesus, peace be upon him, in a very holistic way in the Qur'an. It's not just that he's not the begotten son of God. There's so much more to the story of Isa Islam in the Qur'an. And so as a starting point, when we reach out to our Christian neighbors, we have to start with the person of Christ. That look, we have something in common here. Now let's talk about what we have in common, then let's talk about where our paths now differ and what the implications of that are. That's the way that Allah taught us to reach out to different people, to reach out to different communities. Many of you attended the, the four-week class that we had with Reverend Andy Stoker at First United Methodist, four weeks where we talked about birth, life, crucifixion, and resurrection uh, over four weeks. And you could see what a loving dialogue looks like between Muslims and Christians about the person of Isa Islam without shying away from the differences, but instead stating them after stating the commonalities. Then you establish that, look, Jesus, peace be upon him, to us is not just to win an argument. We don't just try to fit him into some broader picture. He is a central figure in our deen. His birth, his life, and his return are central parts of the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and they mean something to us. I'll point you to the final moment of that class, that four-week class that we had at First United Methodist. When I mentioned that in our tradition, according to a narration of Tirmidhi and others, that Jesus, peace be upon him, after he returns and after he dies, will be buried next to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and Umar in Medina. And I said to the Christians in the church, I said, listen, I want you to just separate for a moment everything we believe about Jesus and everything you believe about Jesus and just think about what reverence this community must have for that man that they would save a spot in the most special place to us as Muslims for this man when he comes back that he would be buried next to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that the prophets are stepbrothers they are stepbrothers and that they share a message and in that sharing of that message they are close to each other and so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says I am the closest person to Isa alaihi so think about it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, I am the closest person to the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, because there is no Nabi between me and him. There is no Prophet that came between me and him. He was the last Prophet before the last Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does it look like in Palestine, in Palestine, in Judea, before Jesus, peace be upon him, comes? Since Julius Caesar, the Romans practiced what's called syncretism, where you had client kingdoms, semi-independent kingdoms. So a people that ruled, but they really were ruled. Okay? Similar to our Muslim countries today. They're client kingdoms, you know, they don't actually have autonomy, right? <laughs> Back then, you had Herod, who's known as the king of the Jews, who operates under the Roman Empire, but it's a semi-independent kingdom. It still has to pay taxes. They still have to answer to a higher Roman authority. And that's something that causes a lot of hatred, a lot of resentment amongst the children of Israel, amongst Bani Israel, that we are still ruled from an outside power. 
that the temple has been destroyed, that we don't have autonomy. And this Herod, who rules from 37 before Christ up until 4 BCE, before Christ, he's a successful king, but he's brutal. He targets political opponents. He murders anyone that he even senses, threatens his rule. And he's really taking away the the Jewish character, if you will, the Abrahamic character, away from Jerusalem, away from Palestine, away from these ideas of Tawheed and monotheism. He's removing all of that character. And instead, he's really focused on turning Palestine into a tourist destination. So he's the one to introduce sculptures and statues in that area, even though these were people that believed in the oneness of God. And everything in that context becomes about to Bani Israel, who is the Messiah that's going to come and liberate us from this humiliation, from this rule. So the focus becomes on a Messiah that will liberate us from this domination that comes from outside. And the weight is for particularly Al-Masih ibn Dawood, not bin Dawood and Hajj and Umrah, the Messiah, the son of David, meaning a Messiah that is a child, a descendant of King David, alayhi salam. And there are many Messiahs in the Bible, and Messiahs are not necessarily prophets. There are Messiahs that are kings, prophets, rabbis. In fact, there's a huge debate in Judaism about whether Dawood, alayhi salam, is a prophet or just a king. A Messiah means someone who's anointed, and when it's stripped of its religious implications, what the focus of that Messiah becomes is establishing the kingdom of God, establishing the rule of God on earth, particularly establishing the temple, the temple of Sulaiman alayhi salam, reestablishing Jerusalem, upholding the Torah, ruling by that. And the specifications of this Messiah really speak to that. He's a leader, he's well oriented with the laws that are followed in Judaism, and Orthodox Jews hold the Messiah, the belief in a Messiah, is one of the 13 principles of faith. So it's a big deal to believe in this Messiah, this messianic figure that comes back and that reestablishes the law and restores the dignity of the law and particularly restores the temple. He's a great military leader. He's someone that brings everyone to the worship of the God of Abraham and he restores the temple. Now the emphasis in that time becomes on just the restoration of the temple. Who's going to come and restore the temple? In that context, there were many messiahs or many people that were looked at as being the potential messiah, the potential messiah. So the messiah was never meant to be a child of God or someone that brings about this new concept of salvation or that dies for the sins of man. The messiah was looked at as a powerful, authoritative figure that really brings the political rule back to Bani Israel. And because theology now was missing from them, deen was missing from them, spirituality was missing from them, corruption was rampant, the focus was all on that political power once again and that political autonomy. So for example, biblically speaking, the Persian king Cyrus, who is called a Messiah, he's called a Messiah because he he defeated the Babylonians and he restored the temple way before Isa alayhi salam. And if you read in Psalm 137, verse 8, O Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy is the one who pays you back for what you have done to us. Move on to 137, verse 9. Blessed is the one who grabs your babies and smashes them against a rock. That's the passion of the restoration of the temple and a Messiah that comes back and gives us back our power. And because the Persian king Cyrus, who's not even from Bani Israel, defeats Babylon and restores the temple, He's given that title of a Messiah. Judas Maccabeus, 160 years before Christ, leads a successful revolt against the Seleucid Empire of the time, purifies the Temple of Jerusalem, and that's where Hanukkah commemorates. Because again, the idea is the restoration of the Temple, the restoration of autonomy, the ability to practice and to rule. It really gives a lot of context to a lot of what happens now as far as the arguments and the claims that are made to Al-Quds, that are made to Jerusalem. In the time of Isa alayhi salam. So there's a, a documentary by National Geographic called The First Jesus. Watch it. It's really, really interesting. It's fascinating. It's called The First Jesus. It's about a man by the name of Simon of Peria. He was only four years before the birth of Christ. He was one of the slaves of Herod. And he's a strong man. He's very cunning. He burnt down Herod's palace in Jericho. He burnt down a lot of his other palaces. So he staged this huge revolt against Herod. And a lot of people thought he was him. 
People thought that must be the Messiah because he was succeeding in doing a lot of things to Herod that had not been done by others. But he was caught and beheaded and that was the end of him. So there's this idea of any time a figure rises, it's just like now, by the way, every day on Twitter, someone else claims to be the Messiah and the Mahdi and they tweet at us and say, I just want to let you know I'm the Messiah. I didn't know Jesus would sign up on Twitter. Uh, and that would be his first actions. But I'm the Mahdi, I'm the Messiah, I'm at Dhul Qarnayn uh, recently as well. So people rise up. But in that situation, it's like, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be, right? So there is a desperate wait that's on for a Messiah, really for political reasons at that time.